Uh, hi, welcome. My name is Shelley Latham. I am the community manager for linkengineering.org, an online educator exchange for PK engineering education. Are you all right, Anne? <laughs> um, Link, Link Engineering is a project of the National Academy of Engineering with sponsorship from Chevron. And today I'm really excited to bring you a video conversation about defining STEM with Greg Pearson and Ann Jolly. Hi, guys. Um, Ann Jolly began her career as a lab scientist. She caught the science teaching bug and was recognized as an Alabama Teacher of the Year during her years as a middle grade science teacher. From 2007 to 2014, Anne was part of a National Science Foundation funded team that developed middle grades STEM curriculum modules and teacher professional development materials for the Mobile Area Education Foundation's Engaging Youth Through Engineering Initiative. Anne has also teamed with science and math teachers to help them develop and implement their own STEM curriculum. Her book, STEM by Design, Strategies and Activities for Grades 4 through 8, was published by Rutledge Middleweb in July of 2016. Welcome, Anne. Um, Greg Pearson is a scholar with the National Academy of Engineering in Washington, D.C. Greg currently serves as the responsible staff officer for two National Science Foundation funded projects, one examining the status, role, and needs of engineering technology education in the United States, the other addressing issues related to capacity building for K-12 engineering educators. He also directs linkengineering.org. He's part of the team I work with. Um, Previously, he has overseen projects addressing STEM integration in K-12 education, standards for K-12 engineering education, the status and prospects for engineering in K-12 education, new messaging for the field of engineering and technology literacy and content standards for the field of technology education. Whew. So I can't really think of a better <laughs> two people to talk to us today about um, what exactly STEM means. And it means different things to different people. And there is perhaps a little bit of confusion among various parties as to what exactly STEM education is or could be or should be. So Greg is going to start us out with um, a little background in how STEM came to be STEM and um, uh, tell us a little bit about his perspective from the National Academy of Engineering. Great, thanks Shelley. And uh, apologies first uh, because of my voice. Those of you who know me know that I don't normally sound this way. I have a cold and I'm a little croaky, but I will uh, do my best to, to uh, enunciate clearly. Um, and thanks for joining. Uh, I see a number of names that I recognize and uh, appreciate you taking time to listen to us today. Um, as Shelley said, the Academy of Engineering and actually the National Academies writ large have had an interest in STEM education for a long time. But um, like most of the education world and policy world for that matter, um, we as an institution until recently haven't been all that clear ourselves about what STEM really is. And to sort of put a point on it that relates to the focus of link engineering, which is engineering in K through 12, I was involved in a project that published a report back in 2009 that examined the current at that time state of efforts to teach engineering in K through 12. The, the committee that produced that report um, made a number of recommendations and observations. And one of the observations that they made was that engineering seemed to be a, a very potentially valuable integrator of other subjects uh, in STEM in particular, but not just STEM. And that there ought to be some effort to look at um, what the research had to say about integrating the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and math. 
because that committee said it seems quite confusing if you listen to the general public discussion or education discussion in terms of what STEM, when that acronym is thrown around, actually is. And that observation actually resulted in another project several years later that Shelley mentioned that did explicitly examine the question of if STEM is more than just a, a casual grouping of these letters in an acronym, that is if it actually suggests that there's a connection between, or can be, or maybe should be connection between science, engineering, math, and technology, or at least some subset of those, how is that done? And what is the evidence that it makes a difference? Um, what do we need to do to prepare teachers to, to teach in a more integrated fashion? And, and again, what does the research show about what the potential benefits are and, and what are the limitations? So uh, we got money from the National Science Foundation to look at this question of uh, what is STEM. And as a baseline, I think it's fair to say that most references even today to STEM education, um, really if you listen carefully are references to science education. Um, so STEM has become a very casual uh, term that is often used to refer to science. Sometimes it may refer to mathematics, uh, but rarely those two things together. And, and the T and the E are often not mentioned at all. But as I said, we looked quite extensively at the literature uh, from the learning sciences and from education research and published a report that looked in some detail at uh, the nature of integration, the potential for integration in STEM, and some of the challenges that, that learners face and educators uh, would face in terms of teaching us. So that report is available on the National Academy's press website, but partly um, I think what we'd like to do now, rather than, of course, you, you can always go and look at the report after this uh, conversation is through, but the committee prepared a short animated video oh. that uh, summarized some of its findings and also tried to define STEM in, in this more integrated fashion. And we thought we would just, it's a short video, it's a little corny, um, but we thought we might show it uh, to you and that could prompt some more discussion, but. What is STEM? It's the acronym for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, the disciplines that are vital for a thriving economy and a safe and healthy society. In kindergarten through 12th grade in the United States, most STEM teaching and learning focuses on science or mathematics. Comparatively little attention has been paid to the T, the products and systems that meet human needs, and E, the creative process used to design these things. And, for the most part, the four subjects have been taught in isolation. But new reform efforts, like the Next Generation Science Standards, are placing more emphasis on the connections between and among the STEM disciplines. To understand how this trend might affect teaching and learning in the future, we need to take a closer look at integrated STEM education, not just the individual subjects that make up the acronym. After all, in the real world, science relies on technology, mathematics, and engineering. And engineering depends on findings from science, the application of mathematics, and the use of technological tools. Imagine if K-12 through students were taught in ways that highlighted these connections. Would they learn more and more deeply? Might they see STEM disciplines as more relevant to their lives? Could it lead more of them to pursue STEM courses and careers? The answers to these questions depend in part on how integrated STEM education is implemented in schools and in out-of-school settings. Research suggests that implementation has to balance learning in the individual STEM subjects with more connected ways of learning. In addition, because it can be hard for students to make these connections themselves, teachers will need to make the connections explicit. Inside the classroom, some teachers may use instructional approaches like problem-based learning or engineering design 
which are special kinds of problem solving, to introduce integrated STEM education to their students. Outside the classroom, students are being exposed to STEM connections in museums and science centers through after-school experiences like some TV shows and STEM-focused robotics competitions and in internships. However, we need more research to better understand the potential benefits and limitations of integrated STEM education for students, teachers, and schools. What, for example, are the implications of integrated STEM education for how schools are organized? How can teachers be better prepared to teach in integrated ways? And how can we test kids to determine what they are really learning and able to apply as a result of integrated STEM experiences? The list of questions is long, but getting answers is important for students, teachers, and the nation. For more information about integrated STEM education, check out the STEM Integration in K-12 Education Report. Link to um, the STEM Integration uh, Report um, in a follow-up email. It will also be attached to the, the recording of this video. It is available as a free download from the National Academy. So um, what do you want to add to that, Greg? Well, <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's an oversimplification, um, but I think actually, based on the popularity of that video, which I think it's got almost a quarter million views now, something like that, um, which is unusual for something in education to begin with and something out of the academies as well, I think it's, it's kind of hit a, a chord with people. It, I, I think educators, teachers, classroom teachers, um, just like the rest of us have been a little too loose or casual or unthinking about uh, using that acronym. And I, I really think it's valuable, even if you're not able to execute completely integrated science or math education or engineering education, to at least appreciate, uh, particularly with respect to engineering design, that math and science really do and can come into play. Um, in productive ways for student learning. Okay, Anne, I want to bring you in. We, um, we do have a, a question that I'm going to, I'm, Kevin will address that question because I think it's a good, good question after we, we hear a little bit from Anne. I'm on a small tablet. In oh, okay. Room. And right. so if I punch, if I punch anything, it, it covers up the pictures and all. So oh, now, okay. okay. Um, when we're uh, talking about STEM, when we first started this, I had some of the most unusual experiences with schools who, who wanted to be declared STEM schools. And one of them, uh, school number one, for example, wanted to be recognized as a STEM middle school. So the principal added a computer program to its course of offering, along with algebra and biology. Now I ask you, is that a STEM school? I wish I could see your responses. <laughs> Try this. Um, here's a school that identifies itself as a STEM school because it offers advanced placement courses uh, in, in math and in science. Does that make it a STEM school? No. In fact, I really, really ran into one that kind of took the cake. It said one middle school said that they were a STEM school because they taught math and science already, and they've been doing that for years. <laughs> what is it that makes a school a STEM school? So let's take a look, if we can, at some of the uh, things that you might ask yourself about your STEM program to see, do we have a STEM school? Shelly, would you put up those criteria? Okay, good. There we go. All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Here's one of the things that you would ask if you wanted to find out, are we doing STEM? I noticed that some of you are, uh, somebody's with NASA and you are actually designing some of the STEM lessons that are up there. I visit NASA quite frequently as far as uh, looking at the websites. And some of you were, someone was uh, working with parents and so forth. Take a look at these ideas to see if you're presenting actually a STEM lesson. First of all, does the lesson present a real problem, an engineering challenge? Uh, and we prefer to call them engineering challenges because it brings in that ever important concept of engineering 
So when I talk to kids, I was talk about not a problem, but an engineering challenge. Um, these can be found in a number of places if you don't have a, uh, if they're just not a lot of them in your head. But uh, first of all, it must be a real problem. Don't use uh, things like little people from space coming down and landing and that kind of stuff. Make it actually real. <laughs> okay. Now then, the second thing, will students relate to the problem? If, you, if they don't relate, then uh, it's not going to be a highly successful thing. Sometimes you may have to do some uh, staging and set things up to get them engaged in the problem. You know, have a video or something or a, a talk with an expert or something to sort of let them see it as a real problem. Probably one of the best things you can do is let the kids identify some problems that uh, they could solve uh, in different ways. Number three, does the lesson allow for multiple acceptable and creative approaches for successfully solving the problem? This is one thing that would uh, separate this from some of the science experiments that I did when I was a science teacher, when I was in school, because I'd give them the approach to use and everybody got the same outcome because there was only one you know, desirable outcome for that particular experiment. Uh, a STEM lesson must allow for a number of acceptable approaches. And uh, the more creative, really, the better. Some can be kind of out of the box, as long as they are within the realm of uh, possibility and, and, and make some kind of sense, given the research the kids have done on this. Number four says, uh, does the lesson integrate and apply important science and math grade level content. Now, this is important. This is where we get off track sometimes. Uh, if I'm a teacher and I'm going to teach a STEM project, we're going to do a STEM project, I'm going, I don't have time to add something extra like that to my curriculum. I'm already in a time crunch to get everything in. So I'm going to choose some math content and some science, with the help of the math teacher, by the way, and some important science content that kids are going to be learning, actually be learning that you're, and we're going to include that so that the STEM is at, the STEM lesson or um, project is, applic is actually, excuse me, an application of that content. We want, this is one of the things that we've got to do is add more rigor to math and to science. We're not going to quit teaching math and science, but we're going to learn how to ratchet up the learning and the rigor by integrating those to, to solve some real world problems and, and show how those interact. And I've actually had students respond to me saying, you know, now I know why I learned about flow rate in math. So it really helps. Number five, does the lesson intentionally use the engineering design process? as the approach to solve problems. The engineering design process is the key here. This whole thing is about integrating math and science through engineering. You take the engineering out and we've got nothing left. It takes the whole STEM apart. So the engineering design process is really important. Now there are a lot of engineering design processes out there, but almost all of them have the same basic components. Here's an example that Shelley downloaded of one. The one on the uh, far right of your screen would, would be the kinds of things, design process that uh, the earlier grades might go through to imagine, to plan, to create, then to improve the thing you created, and then to, uh, well, first you would start with asking the question. Uh, on the left, you have um, the upper grades one that is used sometimes. It's just a little bit more well developed, and you add a research step. You make sure that the kids research. It doesn't have to be uh, paper and pen research. Using a science experiment can be a great way to research some information you need for the project, for the STEM project. Uh, step three, develop possible solutions. Then you go on down, select the best possible one, construct a prototype, test and evaluate, communicate, and then redesign. That's a, a much needed step that sometimes doesn't get done because we run out of time. So um, at any rate, that's the process that you follow because this is teaching the kids how to think 
in a particular way, like an engineer, but it also teaches them a way to solve problems that will carry over through any subject and, you know, through life. The next thing is the lesson actually using a hands-on teaching and learning approach. Standing and stand and deliver doesn't work at all in this. And so PBL is one type of learning approach that we use. Just be really sure that you don't think that because your school is using a PBL approach that you're teaching STEM. That's not the case. You, you focus on STEM, which is ratcheting up the rigor of the math and science using an engineering process and bringing in the technology, but do that in a, a manner that is like PBL. You can use a PBL approach to do that. To ask yourself, okay, now does this lesson lead me, lead the kids to actually design and develop something? If it just stops with them imagining and thinking, well, this might work, and then they write some kind of a report about it, then you haven't done STEM. You've gotten the first two or three steps in there, maybe. Uh, is the role of technology in the lesson clear to the students? Now, the technology does not have to be uh, digital, digital technology, although having kids use the latest digital technology and, and work with that is a good thing to do. Um, technology can also be brought in by having them understand how the technology, maybe the technology that you're creating even, might impact the society or the uh, ecology or environment. You know, what impact does the te do technological systems have? What are technological systems? Uh, what impact do they have? Uh, and recognize the role that technology plays in advancing science. And then just having them be able to make informed decisions about technology. And by the way, do understand the definition that STEM uses of technology. And that is um, technology is anything that is created for, you know, for the use of, of humankind by humankind. That seems a really oversimplified uh, response to that, but it uh, is something I'm trying to think if that, well, anyway, a pencil is technology. Something that has been invented or created by humans for the purpose of uh, meeting a need or a want. So technology includes even the beakers and things that they use in uh, solving problems sometimes. And now let's see, uh, yes, does the, is there some kind of experimentation in testing the solution, evaluating the results, and then does the lesson involve students in communicating their design and results? And then in redesigning, in case that isn't, um, in, in case it doesn't work, which it won't probably the first time. So those are some of the components of a STEM lesson. Uh, now there are a lot of different directions we can go with them, with this, you know, but I wondered if there's any, has anybody popped up a question yet or something that either Greg and I could or I could answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, um, Kevin had sort of addressed the, the issue of, you know, why do we need a definition and, um, you know, do we, are, are we possibly taking away from the component subjects when we, um, put the focus on integration and, um, and Greg, you had a good response to that. I think it would be nice if you could um, share that on the video for the people who are going to be going to be watching it. Um, I was just reflecting on what the the committee that authored this report uh, talked about during many meetings as they were coming to agreement on what the report would say, and there was a lot of discussion about definitions, whether a definition was even possible or desirable. Um, and I think in, in the final analysis, the committee decided that um, it wasn't going to propose a single definition. Uh, they developed what they called a framework, a conceptual framework for thinking about integration in STEM. But the main point that they made that I think is relevant is that yes, it does matter both for teaching and learning, but also for doing research on education. Uh, 
what you are doing and intending to do with respect to the different disciplines in STEM. So in other words, um, there's nothing inherently, you know, terrible about throwing the STEM acronym around. Um, but when push comes to shove, if the teacher is really doing a science lesson, it does a disservice to um, the other components of, of the STEM disciplines not to have any reference to them, for example, if you're using that acronym, simply because it, it gives, it perpetuates, I think, a, um, a lack of full disclosure, I guess, um, with respect to what's being taught and what's being learned. It, there's nothing wrong with having a science lesson that doesn't, um, although with the next generation of science standards, I guess science lessons are, are becoming much more integrative anyway, but there's nothing inherently wrong with doing um, a science activity that doesn't extend into mathematics or into technology or engineering. Um, and, and that's fine. And that should be called a science activity, not a STEM activity. So again, uh, I don't want to quibble about um, the, the specific uh, definition for STEM, but I think it is important for the reasons I outlined that both teachers working in the classroom as well as those looking from the outside, from the research point of view, trying to understand um, how students learn these uh, integrated concepts and how teachers can better teach them. I think it really does make a difference. Uh, our committee thought it made a difference to be explicit um, when about what is being included. And so that's... What would you say to that, Anne? What do you, how do you, how do you see STEM being used um, in schools and um, by educators? And what do you see as the value of having a uh, a clearer, more shared, agreed upon definition of STEM? Well, in, in the first place, the definition itself implies integration of the subjects. That's something that we do very poorly in school. We have silos. And so we have a silo for math and we like to go way high and you know, teach, the, teach you know, really deep math thing. Science, the same thing, let's go way as far as we can in science. We never act like the two even go together. We never act like there's a purpose in learning these. And that's what I have discovered with middle school. And I would imagine it, it carries, and elementary, but I, and I imagine it carries through with high school, is that the kids get so excited when they find out there's a reason for learning math and science and that they do go together. We had a particular project in which kids were uh, building, um, or they were going to construct barriers to stop the flow of sediment uh, from a, a runoff. Uh, and of course, they were simulating all this in the classroom. Every, every group and every team had their own um, set up because they all had different solutions. And uh, that's when these children come to me, they said, oh, now I, learn, now I know why I needed to know how to calculate a flow rate. Now I know why I needed to know how to do these kinds of things because these are being used to solve a problem. I, we do such a disservice when we act like that we only have silos and, and things have no practical meaning outside those silos. And so I think that that's uh, a really important reason for identifying STEM, for identifying the engineering component as the connector, because you have to learn to engineer something with these systems that we're learning, math and science, and for letting the kids wrap their minds around that early on so that by, by the time they get to the workforce, they're used to thinking in the ways that they have to think to solve problems. That includes teamwork, for example, uh, being competent in a lot of different areas, critical thinking, teamwork, innovation, and all that comes to play in STEM. It does not necessarily come to play when you just go straight up vertical with your subjects and they don't meet and get together. And, and the final thing I have to say is that it does, we are, we're getting some test results back that indicate that it does actually ratchet up the degree of learning of math and of science. 
so that that's what we're really after more rigorous learning in those subjects and we just have a better way of doing it stem is actually not a subject it's a way of teaching mm. what do you see as being the greatest hurdle to this integration is it uh teacher training is it uh time is it um support from administration um from parents i don't know you know tell me <laughs> greg do you want to type that one oh no, you go right ahead <laughs> <laughs> boy you named them all now i want to start with teacher professional development and this would be this would be the same for any of you out there who are developing curriculum or anything like that be sure when you're in the school that you're on the same page about what STEM is. It's not robotics. Now, that, that's going to flatten some people <laughs> right there. Robotics can be a STEM curriculum if the robot is designed to solve a particular problem, like maybe a robotic hand or something of that nature. But just to follow a set of instructions and build robots is not STEM. It's fun and it's great to do. It's just not STEM, okay? Uh, so be sure you know what STEM is. Then secondly, let the, or, or work together with other teachers and people who are doing this and coordinate to determine what objectives you're gonna meet through this STEM curriculum. You've got to meet some school objectives, math and science objectives in your school, okay? So it should be wrapped around those. And then give the teachers the engineering design process to follow so that they can, can do this and be sure that they're, uh, you know, incorporating into their lessons. And if you, when you talk about STEM schools, this would be a school that does not, uh, I mean, it teaches all the subjects. There are some great examples out there of how these schools incorporate that design process in every subject. And even in history, their projects are not about copying a, a, a diagram of a pyramid. It's about constructing and coming up with ideas for how that pyramid might have been built and then putting those into some kind of experimental form. There's just all kinds of good things going on when you understand what STEM is trying to accomplish in the heads of kids who are we're trying to prepare for the 21st century. So um, I would just suggest that uh, you, you, you just, I, I might even, well, Administrators can be a problem if they don't understand what STEM is. Um, of course, time is always a problem, especially, that's why we're trying to integrate the, the STEM in with math and science. So you named them pretty well. Greg, can you, yeah. can you maybe tell us a little bit of what, um, what the research so far has shown about the impact of integration? Um, just in terms of outcome or in terms of engagement um, for students and teachers and school communities? Sure. Um, and this research is summarized in that report, as, as I mentioned. Um, and of course, there's been new research since that report has come out. That's the other thing to keep in mind. But um, Maybe not surprisingly, but disappointingly, there's uh, relatively little evidence uh, that we can point to from uh, education research that documents um, improvements in learning above and beyond what might occur in a single subject classroom uh, due to integrative teaching efforts. And this is um, in part because um, it's very difficult to control, to do research and education and control for variables. Um, it also relates to just what we were talking about before, which is that um, researchers have not uh, much tried to use consistent framing of their views of what STEM is or integrative STEM is, and therefore it's very hard to compare uh, results from two or more studies of ostensibly the same phenomenon, but they're actually not the same because the, the research has been framed in a different way. And our report 
talks about that and makes recommendations um, and actually suggests that parts of the report, that framework I mentioned, could be used by researchers to use a more common uh, frame to uh, design research questions and carry out research. So um, that's the high level view, the, the, what everybody wants to know and what, what many people claim is that uh, science learning improves when uh, it's done in the context of integration. Typically, by the way, that integration is involving engineering design activities. That's just, I think for obvious reasons, that is, uh, it's hands-on and it's applied and it's, um, it requires communication and, and problem solving. Uh, there is some evidence that science learning can, can improve, uh, but it's not a slam dunk. Uh, there's, it's been much harder uh, in, in the world of research to document improvements in mathematics learning um, and in fact, some research uh, that's fairly rigorous has found that uh, learning in mathematics can, in some situations, when taught in an engineering design approach, uh, uh, be less than otherwise taught as an individual subject. But again, I want to caution that there, there are so many um, limitations with a lot of this research that it's it's hard to make definitive uh, conclusions a lot of what would be beneficial learning outcomes of course depends on the specific uh, intervention or the, or the instructional approach and the curriculum that are being used and some are simply better than others and we do talk about uh, some of the uh, more interesting integrative um, STEM curricula that are out there in our report. And I would encourage uh, teachers who are interested in, in trying to do a better job of integration to, to look at those and to look at what the committee says about um, the role of the teacher. The role of the teacher is really critical in um, both providing the, or helping students remember often um, specific ideas in science or math or technology that they've learned in another setting and applying them in a way that um, is more concrete related to a design challenge or problem. This is not something that uh, it turns out learners, adults or children do naturally. They don't make these connections. And so educators really have to be explicit about, uh, like Ann said, you know, when there's uh, a calculation to figure out a flow rate, for example, and the design of a, uh, a system for filtering a sediment, that a possibility or desirability of including that information really needs to be uh, pointed out by the, by the educator. Uh, even for students who, who know the ideas and concepts, it's, it's, uh, it's often not the case that they'll make the connections without help. So. Um, there, there are uh, also studies that look at, um, as you mentioned, interests and engagement. And there we have, I think, some stronger evidence that um, more integrated forms of learning are more likely to interest students and to engage them. And engagement and interest are related sometimes to uh, learning, but not always, but they're um, often a prerequisite to learning. Um, and so that is, uh, obviously teachers are always excited if their students are excited and doing an integrated STEM activity where there's a, a design component is much more likely to get students who are um, hands-on learners or uh, students who don't like to sit at the desk all the time to, to get them engaged. There is a little bit of data that needs to be explored further that these sort of integrative approaches to learning are more likely to engage uh, underrepresented groups, particularly um, African-American students. Um, and so there, there's definitely things that are we can point to. It's just not as the, 
the evidence is not as strong as any, any of us would like, I think, at this point. And what's your what's your take on it? I'm gonna I I'm actually going to um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I, I appreciate your very detailed research, and I did ask you about the research, Greg, and and the national academies are uh, that's what you're there for to represent the research and to do the research. But I do think there's a, there is just an anecdotal case to be made that this integrated approach. Um, is more fun. What do you think, Ann? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt about that, for sure. And, um, and I wanted to also make the point that we, as classroom teachers, are absolutely controlled by standardized testing, you know, those math and science scores. We really want those to show different. Okay, let me tell you what we did. Uh, I was working with the, uh, on some curriculum for uh, the National Science Foundation, or, or under a National Science Foundation grant, I should say, not for the National Science Foundation. And uh, when it was very carefully controlled. All the studies on it, of course, were very carefully controlled. It was a, a five-year kind of thing. And here's some things that we found with those controlled studies that were uh, outside evaluators, okay? That uh, kids who had well-designed STEM lessons, as few as three to four per year showed a greater depth and breadth of thinking, being able to look at a situation and show, you know, and think about it in a, a logical and uh, procedural kind of manner. They had a higher ability to critique project designs. Now, how about that for a good outcome? They had a better ability to use data than a group of comparison students who are not systematically exposed to the STEM lessons. So, you know, we had, the, uh, that was just a, a few of the outcomes that you might call uh, not measurable in terms of standardized testing. But we do have some good evidence on that. Uh, that, Greg, was from a group of researchers, Van Hannigan, and et cetera, that you might be interested in that study. Right. That, uh, you're raising a really good point, Anne, and I should have said that too, but um, part of the problem is just what you said, uh, that we're uh, so focused on measuring these outcomes that are yeah. driven by assessments um, that we uh, have not paid as much attention to other kinds of desired um, behaviors and dispositions that, that are probably more important, to be honest, than than knowing specific facts or, or processes in science or, or math. And so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Well, and it and that kind of speaks to the, from what I understand, part of the whole impetus to looking carefully at how science and math are being taught and um, developing a, a STEM approach really is very directly connected to how scientists and engineers and technologists and stuff function in the workplace like what it actually is to do those things once one has has sort of moved on and um yeah those things are not uh those skills are not necessarily going to be measured on a standardized test so can you speak a little bit? We're, we're getting towards the end here, and, and, and there is a, a very interesting question that, that from the um, attendees that I want to ask. But before we get off of this, do you, do you want to talk at all about the, the job readiness and the career um, work, workplace aspect of this, which, which does seem to be a big part of it and how STEM is used? Well, I think. Sorry, go ahead, Anne. No, you go ahead, Greg. I'll... Well, I was going to say, I think Anne has actually sort of uh, covered that in a way. Um, these, um, they're called, they've got a bunch of different names over time, uh, 21st century skills, higher order skills, uh, professional skills. There are different labels that have been used over the last couple decades to describe these um, harder, hard to measure um, attributes that are valued by employers and employers are pretty consistent, um, have been consistent over time and also across industry sectors about 
the value of having uh, employees who are flexible in their thinking, who can um, be uh, okay with uncertainty, who are able to work in teams and able to communicate, um, among other things. Those are uh, some of the top order qualities that employers want. And you can kind of do a mapping of the um, elements of at least the engineering process, problem solving process as, uh, as laid out in the diagrams that you showed earlier, Shelley. Um, and it's not just engineering, it, science has all of those qualities as well. Um, and certainly the next generation science standards are doing a much better job of, of uh, having students be involved in things that are closer to uh, what would happen in, in the world of work and, um, and therefore are more likely probably to develop some of the skills and competencies that employers are looking for. So um, I th the more relevant, the more connected, the more, um, yeah, the more relevant and connected and uh, interesting uh, the problems are for young people, the more likely these other um, higher order skills, professional skills are, are going to get nurtured. And you can also uh, measure to some degree uh, how how well kids are acquiring those skills. That's one thing that we recommend as te to teachers as you go along, you know, the kinds of assessments that you do, the formative assessments, you can gauge how well your kids are working in teams and how well they're self monitoring their work and what they think about that. You can gauge uh, or how well they apply the knowledge in, you know, of math and that they've learned in math and science. You can gauge how well they're using the engineering design process as they go along, which is a thinking process that they're learning. And you, one thing it really impacts is their skills, their attitudes, and their confidence. When they realize that they can solve problems, it makes their attitudes dramatically change uh, about different subjects. They go from not even wanting to go in the subject's classroom to not waiting, can hardly wait to get there. And don't forget about the diversity we have in this nation in terms of uh, people and uh uh, abilities and the different types of abilities and things of that nature. STEM is a great place for kids to come together with, you know, even kids who have challenges and so forth and work successfully to accomplish things and so that they feel good about what they've done and they've actually played, a, had a contributing role. And it's certainly a great place for minorities, for girls, for people like that that have been traditionally underrepresented in those um, um, vocations to gain sp speed and to come aboard with that. That was great. Um, we did have a question that I want to get to, which is how do you guys feel about adding letters to STEM? <laughs> the, the most, the most uh, popular one is obviously STEAM uh, with the addition of um, art. Um, although I was at a conference where they, their A stood for architecture, which I thought was very interesting. So I think, I think as the letters get added, um, they seem to be added by people who have a strong reason to want to add them. So what do you, what do you think about additional letters? Well, I mean, I think it's just what you said, um, that people, uh, in a particular area um, that feel ignored or neglected, um, but know that their subject matter is very relevant and interesting, want to find ways to make that point. And um, I certainly understand that. And I personally have no objection to STEAM. There's also STEM with two M's, with one of the M's being medicine. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, as long as you want, as I think I said before, as I think as long as one is being clear about the use of the term and what you intend by it, uh, that's the most important thing to me, uh, to not use these acronyms as casually as it 
typically been used. Um, if you really want to advance um, education in these areas that are more connected in a connected way, you really do have to be um, clear about what you mean and tell others what you mean and then try to practice what you preach. So there's plenty of art in engineering, as most of you probably know, and um, there's lots of history in science and there's history in engineering. Somebody asked earlier uh, in the chat window about, you know, including ethics and social studies and absolutely there are um, design challenges, for example, in engineering that, that surface the need to think about culture and society and ethical issues as, as in fact almost every engineering challenge and solution should. Um, so I think it's a rich, a rich area that's my personal view that uh, it's artificial to put barriers around four letters. I mean, they're accidental uh, to begin with, in a sense, they came about through some um, sort of arbitrary writings of a couple of NSF program officers back in the nineties is my understanding. And, um, but there is a logic to it. You know, I'm not saying they're, they're not, they shouldn't be together. There is a logic to thinking about these subjects together, but I think it is also logical to think about art in, and other of the social sciences. What's your take on it, Anne? Well, have you ever taught something to students without drawing a sketch of, as you were doing that? You know, that's art, <laughs> you're drawing sketches. We're asking kids to sketch uh, their, their, their thinking and so forth and present it to you. Art is automatically included. We ask people, you know, after, they can, after a product is invented, then we got to have, we need some way to make it beautiful, make it, uh, you know, engineers are not lacking in skills uh, as far as, you know, design skills and uh, as far as art is concerned. But I do think that the art, you know, has some kind of um, ability to help generate creativity. But it, it can't be just artificially thrown in there. So, oh, we've got to do art with this. Well, why? What purpose will the art serve in this project? Then it can be incorporated. Maybe it won't serve any in one particular project that you can see, although I don't know how you, you can't get through any kind of lessons without some kind of pictures, art, or whatever, you know. <laughs> but um, if you're asking if we should have art taught specifically, uh, in every STEM project, we've got to include art, we've got to include social studies. No, 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 no. STEM, actually, it's making strong connections between math and science and uh, in a well thought out intentional approach. And to the extent that other subjects are brought into that, then that's very important. We certainly need a lot of language arts skills and maybe even some speech skills and so forth during the communications phase. So everything works together. Let's just don't decide that, well, since everything works together, we're just gonna spread everything out equally to put equal focus on everything in a STEM project, no. We've got to keep STEM, the STEM focus and the STEM purpose as the main driver, and then naturally incorporate the other subjects, I think. Well, I think that's probably a really great place to end it with STEM representing the great integration of all that, all ways of seeing and being and communicating uh, and working together uh, to solve problems. Um, I'm going to share the screen for just a second before we say our goodbyes to tell you about our next program coming up. Uh, this is next Thursday, November 1st. We have family engagement in pre-K through 12 engineering education with Linda Kakelis and Tara Chlofsky. Um, this is going to be a a uh, fun conversation about how important families are to STEM education and all the different ways that you can um, bring families into that process um, and get some wonderful results as well. Uh, I want to thank so much our guests today, 
Ann Jolly and Greg Pearson. All the rest of you, uh, please make sure that you check out linkengineering.org. If you haven't been there, if you're not currently a member, you don't have to be a member to use the resources there, but it is a place where you can, uh, you can get some basics on, on engineering and engineering education. You can also share resources that you found to be helpful. You can even ask questions of people who might have some answers for you. So we really encourage you to check out linkengineering.org. Uh, it's been my pleasure to host this event and uh, hope to see you all again at another video conversation, maybe next week even. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.